person can take this game and they can immerse themselves in the world or they can do things with it and they just and it's it's fun for them that's it's always what we're shooting for it's basically how to how to create fun for people and that's an elusive target <laughs> but it's something that we're always you know trying to do among games that have defined the real-time strategy genre command and conquer is seen as one of the most influential titles the cnc franchise along with warcraft and starcraft shaped the identity of RTS games during the 90s and would influence the designs of countless similar strategy titles in later years. They started it and every other strategy game you can practically think of evolves from there. Even though the franchise ended with a whimper instead of a bang, it managed to create an indelible impact on the history of video games. Join us as we take a look at the rise and fall of Command & Conquer. Well, the very first real-time strategy game that we made, and, and frankly, probably the very first game anybody would recognize as a real-time strategy game, was called Dune 2. We shipped this product, it did very well, and we decided to do our own original property around the concepts, the core compulsions, which made this strategy game so much fun. Unit ready. Command & Conquer began development in 1992 after Westwood finished Dune 2. Taking place in an alternate history of modern day, players could choose to side with the Global Defense Initiative or the Brotherhood of Nod. Using FMV or full motion video to tell the story, Westwood employees would play multiple roles in the cutscenes. Most notably, Joseph Kukin, who worked at Westwood, played the role of the titular villain, Kane. Now, do it again in French and German. I want 300 copies made and sent to every TV station in Europe. We have the satellite for another 10 minutes. Is that camera still running? The campiness of the FMV scenes would become a hallmark of the series and added a B-movie feel to the story. A common element of this series would be the hunt for the alien material known as Tiberium. In the first game, it simply acted as a resource to the player, but Tiberium would play a greater role in later games. The first Command & Conquer would go on to sell over 3 million copies and was ported to multiple platforms. Uh, and at the time, a lot of people didn't think that the game had a lot of possibilities. We had original forecasts in tens of thousands of units, like 60,000 units, versus the 2 plus million that we sold. So uh, it was quite a leap of faith to get that product out. Now once we actually showed it to the public, once we saw the people's eyes light up, once we saw them playing, I think everybody kind of got a hold of the idea that this is something really different, something special, something big. In 1996, the game was supported with a single expansion pack dubbed the Covert Operations, which added new missions for both Nod and GDI, as well as a Jurassic Park mode to the game. So, what we figured was, hey, we could take the basic mechanics of the game, create all new sides, all new units, all new balancing, and um, you know, change the graphics to some extent, but we really needed a new theme. Instead of continuing with the storyline of Command & Conquer, Westwood would then work on the first of many spin-offs of the series with Command & Conquer Red Alert. Red Alert took place in an alternate history of World War II, where Hitler was killed before he rose to power, thanks to time travel. Without Hitler, the USSR began to take over and the Allies were forced into a different war. Red Alert was originally positioned, narrative-wise, to be a precursor to Command & Conquer, but this proved to be a problem in terms of continuity and was ignored in later games. In the first Red Alert, it was shown that Kane was the instigator of the USSR and Allies fighting, and that the war would lead to the rise in power of the Brotherhood of Nod and the formation of the GDI. Comrade Chairman, I am the future. The game received two expansion packs in 1997. Counter-Strike added new units and maps to Red Alert, as well as a series of secret ant missions in which the player was tasked with holding off an invasion of giant mutant ants. The Aftermath further supplemented the game with new single-player missions, units, and balancing changes to the multiplayer. Around this time, a multiplayer-only spin-off of Command & Conquer dubbed Soul Survivor was released to the public. The game was a drastic departure from the series in terms of gameplay and received criticism from fans for its repetitiveness and shallow design. Soul Survivor never gained the popularity that its RTS predecessors did, but was praised for its attempt to create a unique experience within the Command & Conquer franchise. 
The success of Red Alert meant a return to the universe in a few years, but there was trouble behind the scenes. In 1998, Electronic Arts bought Westwood for $122.5 million and would take control over the Command & Conquer franchise to this day. The increased demands of EA would lead to members of Westwood quitting the studio and an impact on the quality of their games. The first Command & Conquer game under EA's publishing was Command & Conquer Tiberian Sun, released in 1999. Taking place in the year of 2030, the game introduced more sci-fi elements to the series. The battle between the GDI and Nod grew with the world being taken over by the Tiberium. Besides having the two storylines, players could also choose what missions to do and could unlock bonus levels and more rewards based on their progress. The production values were improved with Tiberian Sun, featuring a new game engine and more recognized actors for the FMV sequences. Besides series of star Joseph Kukin, Michael Bean and James Earl Jones also starred in Tiberian Sun. Well, in the four years between Command and & Conquer and Tiberian Sun, um, the game Command & Conquer had been imitated so many times in so many different ways, it really put a really high bar for Tiberian Sun. And in fact, computers had come a long way, they were much more powerful, so we were really able to explore the three-dimensional aspects of the world, the characters, the, the units themselves, take tanks that were now hovercraft, and, and you know, the Orca flyers that became Orca bombers, and all sorts of cool things like that. Just all this imaginative stuff that came out of the science fiction, of the mixture of the alien technology along with these, these uh, you know, sort of evolution of war machines. Unfortunately, EA's control over the development led to the game being rushed. Improved systems like a loadout screen were in the works but couldn't be finished before EA's deadline. Despite the issues, Tiberian Sun and its expansion, Firestorm, were both praised for continuing the series and RTS design. In 2000, Westwood returned to the Red Alert universe with Red Alert 2. The setting is now 1972, when the USSR invades the United States and thanks to the psychic Yuri, the US falls under Soviet control. The multiplayer received an upgrade by allowing players to take control of different nations from each side. These choices would affect which units they would have access to during a match. From a design point of view, Red Alert 2 continued the series' tradition of asymmetrical balance. The USSR featured stronger units, while the Allies had more diverse units and were stronger in the late game. The real ideas behind Red Alert 2 are to give the player lots of options and lots of choices that he can be creative with in the gameplay. And this applies to the units where you know, each unit has multiple different roles um, that it can take on. Red Alert 2 was a critical success and was followed up by an expansion. Yuri's Revenge continued the original story with Yuri taking over the world. Both the USSR and Allied factions got new units to use, and Yuri's army would be playable in multiplayer. They will not escape. Player defeated. Despite Westwood's pedigree for the RTS genre, their next game came out of left field. Command & Conquer Renegade was not only a return to the first game setting, but was also a first-person shooter. Renegade followed the exploits of Nick Havoc Parker, a GDI commando. Instead of continuing the main game storyline, Renegade takes place during the first Tiberium War and followed Havoc's mission to save scientists kidnapped by Nod. Even though it was Westwood's first FPS, the game earned average reviews. Conflict of interest? No. <laughs> I got interest in conflict. Sadly, despite the success of the series, Renegade would be the last game in the Command & Conquer universe developed by Westwood. In 2002, following the failure of the MMO Earth & Beyond, EA closed Westwood Studios. However, before the studio was shut down, Westwood had started work on several continuations of the Command & Conquer franchise. Command & Conquer Continuum was an MMO based on the Tiberium universe. Players could choose between different factions to play as, with more content to be added after release. There was a planned sequel to Renegade taking place in the Red Alert 2 universe. Renegade 2 made it past pre-production, but was ultimately cancelled in late 2003, due to the possibility of the game taking purchases from Battlefield 1942. Finally, there was Command & Conquer Tiberian Incursion. This would have been the real third game in the Tiberium universe. 
The game would also introduce the alien species known as the Skrin, who would be revealed as the species who sent Tiberium to Earth. The Skrin and some of the designs of incursion would find their way into Tiberium Wars. With Westwood no longer in the picture, development of the franchise was shifted over to newly formed EA Pacific, which was made up of some of the former employees of Westwood at the time. While work was started on a follow-up to Tiberian Sun, EA wanted a more contemporary military RTS for the Command & Conquer franchise. Fire at will! opportunity to bring Command & Conquer as a franchise into the 3D world. Finally, we had 3D hardware that could actually generate these huge cities with shadows and characters and tons of hundreds of units all battling it all out at the same time. Using the newly created Strategy Action Game Engine, or SAGE, EA Pacific released Command & Conquer Generals in 2003. Despite the name, Generals had no relation to the previous Command & Conquer games and took place in a future version of our world. The GDI and NOD factions were replaced by the U.S., China, and the Global Liberation Army, or GLA. In this game, the GLA was a fanatical terrorist group who wanted to take over the world, with the U.S. and China positioned as the only two countries to take them on. Like previous games in the series, each of the three factions had their own units, tech trees, and style of play. The U.S. had the most advanced and expensive units, China was able to mass large armies, and the GLA could make use of sneak attacks. Command & Conquer Generals sold well enough to get an expansion, Zero Hour. Zero Hour's claim to fame was the inclusion of the general system. Each faction had multiple generals that each emphasized different aspects of the faction. By selecting a general, the player could access special units unique to that general, but with some kind of cost associated with it. The Air General, for instance, had access to cheaper and more powerful air units, but did not field any tank units. Following the release of Generals, EA Pacific was folded into EA Los Angeles, who would take on the development of all future RTS games in the Command & Conquer series. For fans who wanted to return to the traditional Command & Conquer universe, they would have to wait until 2007 with Command & Conquer 3 Tiberium Wars. You can't kill the Messiah. Tiberium Wars officially introduced the Skrin faction to the franchise. As with previous games in the series, each faction had their own unique takes on units, strategies, and base design. The Skrin faction could be unlocked after finishing the GDI and Nod campaigns and were also playable in multiplayer. Introducing the aliens also came with designing the faction to be different from the other two. The Skrin were immune to the effects of Tiberium and had their own unique superweapon. FMV cutscenes made a return to the series. Joseph Kukin reprised his role as Kane, along with new additions like Michael Ironside, Billy D. Williams, and more. The big point about Command & Conquer 3 was it trying to take over the eSports crown from StarCraft. EA heavily promoted Command & Conquer 3 on the professional scene with the touted Battlecast system. Battlecast allowed players to set up matches, spectate in games, and allow commentators to provide commentary during play. Tiberium Wars was followed up with an expansion titled Kane's Wrath. Wrath would introduce a new game mode in the form of Global Conquest. Global Conquest allowed players to play on a turn-based map to try to take over the world and defeat the other players. This kind of system was previously featured in the Battle for Middle-Earth series, also developed by EA Los Angeles. Sub-factions similar to Red Alert 2 and Command & Conquer Generals also made an appearance, along with new units for the three main factions. Instead of having new campaigns for the factions, the expansion story focused on Kane and traced his actions from before Tiberian Sun to after Command & Conquer 3. Peace through power! No, no, touch nothing! We mustn't do anything to disrupt space-time continuum. The next game in the series was Command & Conquer Red Alert 3. Released in 2008, the story took place during the mid-80s where the USSR was about to be defeated. Using time travel, they went back to kill Einstein, who was critical to the Allies' defense and eventual victory. However, taking Einstein out altered the time stream further and brought in Japan, or the Empire of the Rising Sun, as a new superpower. 
Red Alert 3 would mark major changes to the base gameplay of the Command & Conquer series. The new faction brought with it new units, strategies, and balancing. The Empire's units have the ability to transform into different modes at will, altering their utility. For the first time in the series, every campaign map was designed around co-op play. You could either play them online with a friend or use an AI partner. Besides the Empire's transforming units, every unit in the game had some kind of special ability or something for the player to control. This made Red Alert 3 more micro-intensive compared to previous games in the series. Another major difference was a greater focus on naval combat. Sea battles in most RTS titles were downplayed in favor of land and air fights. With Red Alert 3, naval battles became a major focus of the game, with each side getting a variety of units. Red Alert 3 had an expansion with Uprising, which added three mini-story campaigns for each faction and one special campaign. The fourth campaign followed the Empire's psychic unit, Eureka, and was about commanding her instead of an army. Uprising also added in the Commander's Challenge Mode. The Challenge Mode was built around fighting generals, similar to the Zero Hour expansion for Command and Conquer Generals. The different generals would attack you with varying strategies and teams of units. Red Alert 3 sold well enough, but was not without some PR problems. The game featured SecureROM DRM that limited the number of machines you could install a single copy of the game onto. After outcries from fans, SecureROM was removed from Red Alert 3 a month after going on to Steam. During this time, plans for another spin-off of the Command & Conquer series were announced. Tiberium was to be a squad-based tactical shooter in which the player would be able to coordinate their units against the Skrin forces invading Earth. In Tiberium, players would have taken control of GDI forward battle commander Ricardo Vega in a campaign that takes place after the events of Tiberium Wars. The game was cancelled shortly after it was announced in 2008 by EA, citing a lack of quality as the main reason. EALA made one last attempt at revisiting the concept of a tactical first-person shooter with Project Camacho, this time set in the General's universe. The game would have allowed players to take control over American resistance members as they fought against Chinese belligerents invading the USA. Unfortunately, Camacho never made it past the concept phase, with only scant concept art and prototype images from its short existence in 2008 and 2009 still surviving. Interestingly, the MMORTS concept of Soul Survivor was revisited around 2008 when EALA started development on Command & Conquer Arena. The game was to be a multiplayer spin-off of Tiberium Wars and Kane's Wrath, aimed at the Asian market. However, the project never made it far into development and was ultimately transformed into Command & Conquer 4 Tiberian Twilight. So we have... Um a new class-based gameplay. Uh, you have a mobile base now, so no longer are you stuck in one place on the map. Uh, we're going a little more in, in the accessible standpoint of it, but I want to reinforce that we're not removing the strategic depth. I'm sorry, I totally missed uh, that word you said. What, what happened to the screen? Are we going to see them reappear? One time, I'm totally not understanding. Is it <laughs> progression, earning experience applies to the entire game all of the time, no matter how you play it. What's, what's going on with this? I mean, how is this adding to the already compelling CNC experience? I have no idea what you're talking about. So um, it's a much more uh, friendly way to kind of get into RTS, a little bit less intimidating than StarCraft II. Based on that feedback, we actually brought back some Tiberium harvesting, which we had completely gotten rid of. We have a class system, which is generally more common with first-person shooters than with real-time strategy games. For the veterans of CNC, are they going to be able to adapt? Is this going to be something that's of interest? Well, well, we're hoping they can adapt. I just want to encourage players to give CNC4 a shot. I know we're trying a lot of things a bit different. You know, it, it's time for a bit of a change. A lot of RTS games are getting kind of to be a little bit of the same. Tiberia Twilight is merely a CNC game by association. Command & Conquer 4 probably isn't what you expected. In 2010, the series began its fall from grace among RTS fans with Command & Conquer 4, Tiberian Twilight. Tiberian Twilight was a massive gutting of the Command & Conquer design from top to bottom. The Skrin, who were introduced as a playable faction in Command & Conquer 3, were relegated to a neutral faction. Power and general base building for the GDI and Nod were also taken out. Base building was replaced by a new mobile HQ and a focus on class-based battles. Each faction could take one of three types of mobile construction vehicles, or MCVs. 
Depending on which of the three you chose, offense, support, or defense would determine your options and units available. Instead of defeating your opponent's base, the game focused on capturing areas on the map for points. It's important to point out that Command & Conquer 4 came out after the successes of Company of Heroes and Warhammer 40k Dawn of War, both with a focus on point capture. The real cut to the gameplay came with Twilight's new persistence system for unlocking units. Playing through the campaign or skirmish matches online would award you experience points. The only way to unlock new units, structures, and technologies was to level up. The problem was that this system instantly created an unfair disadvantage for new players wanting to jump into multiplayer. The differences between a new player and a fully leveled player were huge, thanks to stronger units, more options, and them being all around better. This made fighting against the AI even tougher due to them having better units starting out. Unless you grind experience to raise your level, your only other option was to use the game's co-op mode for the campaign. After the problems with Red Alert 3 in terms of Secure Rock, EA doubled down with requiring an always-on internet connection for Command & Conquer 4, even if you were playing it for the single-player story. For fans of Command & Conquer, this was the game that just devastated the franchise. Following the poor reviews, EA Los Angeles was rebranded to Danger Close Games and put to work on the Medal of Honor series. What came next was seen by fans as two major nails in the coffin for the Command & Conquer series. In 2011, EA announced that a sequel to Command & Conquer Generals was officially in the works. With EA Los Angeles no longer working on the series, development was shifted to Victory Games. So the core concepts in the original Command & Conquer um, RTS games were really about building a base, defending that base, and building an assault army that you could go attack the other base. First thing we said is we need to kind of wash the stain of CNC4 away. And to do that, you really have to get back to your roots to get back to what it was that made your fans your fans in the first place. Command & Conquer Generals 2 was supposed to take the series back to the base building and resource management gameplay that Command & Conquer 4 went away from. In 2012, it was then revealed that the Generals 2 content would be dropped and the game would be simply renamed Command & Conquer. The plan was to take the story-based content of Generals 2 and work that into a planned separate game, while Command & Conquer would become a free-to-play title. In an effort to please fans, EA later announced they'd introduce downloadable single-player missions after the game's release. But the news would be too little too late. The game's troubled development coupled with pushback from fans would eventually prove to be too much. And on October 29, 2013, EA pulled the plug on Command & Conquer. The main reason cited was negative feedback from players who participated in the game's alpha trial. On the same day, EA also closed Victory Games and the project was completely canned. The last piece of news regarding Generals 2 or Command & Conquer came in November of 2013. EA announced that they would be working on a brand new Command & Conquer with a new studio at the helm. At this moment, there have been no official announcements from EA regarding this game. During the trouble with Command & Conquer Generals 2, EA Phenomic was working on a browser-based strategy MMO titled Command & Conquer Tiberium Alliances. Tiberium Alliances was a massive downgrade in terms of strategy and design, focusing more on the browser MMO trend of increasingly bigger pay and time barriers to keep people playing. Command & Conquer Tiberium Alliances went into beta in March of 2012 and was released in May of that year. Around this time, a spin-off called Red Alert Alliances was also in the works. However, it was cancelled later in its development when Electronic Arts closed EA Phenomic in 2013. The studio Envision Entertainment, which was partially made up of former Phenomic employees, became the new developers of Tiberium Alliances. The game is still being maintained, but there have been no announcements regarding the future of the franchise as a whole. The Command & Conquer series has come a long way from the days of popularizing the RTS genre. According to EA in 2009, the franchise as a whole earned about $30 million. Instead of the series going downhill immediately after the creators were no longer a part of it, EA Los Angeles did manage to put out several great takes on the Command & Conquer formula. Tiberium Wars, Red Alert 3, and Generals were all well received by fans and reviewers alike. Looking at the changes down the line, EA wanted the series to be the next great esports game. 
That meant speeding up the gameplay and becoming more micro-intensive over time. The co-op focus that started with Red Alert 3 could be viewed as their attempt at differentiating the multiplayer gameplay from StarCraft. That all culminated with Tiberian Twilight, which had very little of the iconic Command & Conquer DNA. The problem, of course, is that StarCraft has dominated the esports RTS scene, and there is little room for a game similar to it. Command & Conquer may have not achieved the same multiplayer greatness that other RTS games did, but it was different enough, thanks to its rich stories and genre-defining gameplay, to sustain itself for nearly two decades. In an age of reboots and spiritual successors, perhaps we'll see the return of Tesla coils, rocket buggies, and the Brotherhood of Nod once more. Or at least another series of ant levels. For more, and all things Command & Conquer, stay subscribed to Gamers.